Okay, uh, welcome all to the September 5th, 2023 EFCC meeting. I'm gonna call the meeting to order. It's uh, 10.01 and we'll start with a roll call. Uh, Chris Johnson. Uh, here. Uh, thank you. Uh, with us virtually, Eric. Present. And Brennan Gereltz, I'm here. Uh, committee staff, Lorna Hobbs. Present. Very good. And Nancy is with us virtually. Are you still there, Nancy? Permanent Nancy Hirsch, the Emergency Fire Cost Committee Administrator here virtually. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so again, this is per the usual now a hybrid meeting. Um, and I believe uh, we will ask uh, Crystal, if there's anyone in the group that you need to help identify for attendees, uh, let me know. We can call them out. Um, well, we would ask that everyone keep their mics muted. Uh, and when it's time for an agenda item from staff to update us on, I'll, I'll call on them. And if there is public comment, we'll take that at agenda item number 12. And if you do have public comment, uh, we'd ask that you uh, either raise your hand, use that tool, or type in the chat, and we'll call on you when we get to there. Uh, committee meeting materials were sent to members prior to the meeting, and uh, any meeting materials that get uh, brought forward in this meeting will get updated to the Board of Forestry websites under committees, EFCC, as quickly as possible after the meeting. Um, as for chair comments, uh, I have a couple here. Um, one, I want to recognize uh, Catherine Van Nenna, who's with us today. Uh, Catherine is being put forward as uh, to fill the vacancy of um, Steve Caffaretta. Uh, Catherine was, went through our newly adopted uh, committee appointment process and um, we look forward to working with her. She currently sits on the Northwest Oregon uh, Forest Protective Association and as a is also a budget committee member on that association. Uh, she represents small woodland owner, uh, Roman V Ranch, LLC. And uh, she comes with good background of understanding forest management um, and uh, was formerly a regulatory affairs director for Oregon's pulp and paper industry association as well. Uh, Catherine, good luck. I hope the board uh, moves through your recommendation for appointment to this committee swimmingly. Um, on another note, uh, I want to just give a brief update on Senator Steiner's work group for fire funding. Um, we've had a one introductory meeting. Uh, it was a, a group of rate payers. Uh, in addition to ODF, Cal was present for that meeting. Um, we are rather uh, sworn to secrecy in that meeting at this time, but all in all, it was a very uh, it, it, not very good secrecy, perhaps, but it was a, it was a very good meeting, and um, I look forward to the work that can come out of that, and also being able to see Senator Steiner deliver on some of the recommendations that may come forward for that, uh, both for the benefit of ratepayers in Oregon, but also for ODF and your financial success as well. And finally, uh, I want to commend ODF staff everyone in the room uh, for the success we have seen this fire season. I was talking to Nancy earlier today on the way up and given the, the lightning, the weather, the fuels that we have faced, it has been a very successful season. I think it needs to be um, stated that there is no expectation that Oregon's firefighters catch every single fire. And the fact that I don't, I haven't even heard the weather report of how many downstrikes we had over the course of what seems like maybe the last three weeks, but the amount of fires started, the amount of catches, uh, it's just, it's impressive. It truly is. And uh, while I'll take the weather, uh, we have to, that we're 
getting right now, I also have to recognize that it's been some very hard work on the ground, um, taking on some very challenging conditions throughout this summer. And I very much appreciate that on behalf of all Oregon landowners, very much appreciate that. And that benefits not just the ratepayers, but also all Oregonians, because wildfire today is an all Oregonian problem. Uh, we'll end with that, just a thank you. Okay, moving on to agenda item number two, approval of the minutes of the June 6, 2023 EFCC meeting. Uh, can I, these meetings were sent out to uh, committee members, but also they were reviewed by both Administrator Nancy Hirsch and Eric Lease. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes as emailed? I'll move to approve the minutes as emailed. And a second? I'll second it. Chris, you're on mute, just so you know. All right. Uh, and a vote to approve the motion to uh, approve the minutes as emailed. All those in favor, respond with aye. 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 And that's a unanimous vote, none opposed. Okay, uh, we'll close number two and move to number three, uh, the financial status of the OFLPF. Uh, Ms. Hobbs, can you please give us a financial report? Certainly, good morning, Lorna Hobbs, EFCC Finance Coordinator. My report today covers the Oregon Forest Land Protection Fund's fiscal year 2023 ending balance and revenue and expenditure projections for fiscal year 2024. Starting with fiscal year 23, uh, there's a copy of that report in your packet, but it is not up on the screen at the moment. Um, the ending balance on June 30th was $11,928,752. Sorry, $11,928,752. Total revenues received in fiscal year 23 came to $12,348,359. In addition to that, the fund received $1,555,980 in reversals that were owed for previous fiscal year payments for a total of $13,904,339. Expenditures in fiscal year 23 totaled $12,931,170. $185,000 was transferred for operating expenses, and we expect that to be um, slightly um, less than that, but um, we need to reconcile payroll um, before we can determine if there's money owed back or if we owe more. Uh, fiscal year 23 claim total is estimated at $18,655,688. So 50% of that would be um, 9.3 million from the Oregon Forest Land Protection Fund's obligation. And uh, 9.7 million was actually transferred. So there may be some money coming back from that once uh, that year is reconciled. Um, if there's, I'll stop there in case there's any questions on fiscal year 23 before I move on to 24. Hearing none, going on to fiscal year 24, which is showing on the screen. The beginning balance on July 1st, 2023 was $12,029,626. And this included a repayment from Coos Forest Protection Protective Association of $100,873 um, to pay uh, balance on their advance for fire season 2018. So this amount um, will be reallocated uh, for the fiscal year fiscal year 19 claims, and it'll be reflected on my next report. So that's the difference between the ending balance for 23 and the starting balance for 24. So going on to projections, projected, projected revenue um, for fiscal year 24, 
Assessment revenues are projected at $9,211,101. Harvest tax revenues are projected at $2,041,531. And interest income is projected at $622,047. And a note that the interest rate has risen uh, to 4.3 in July and again to 4.5% in August. So estimated total revenue for fiscal year 24 is at 11 million eight hundred and seventy four thousand six hundred and seventy eight dollars. Projected expenditures for fiscal year 24, we are keeping the payroll and operating expenses. Estimated at $185,000 and the funds payment for fiscal year 24 severity costs for this fire season is estimated at $3 million. Current estimated net claim totals to date for fiscal year 24 is uh, currently at $13,120,824. Estimated expenditures for fiscal year 24 is $13,185,000. Um, to date, a total of $2.149 million has been advanced to the Coos Forest Protective Association. 409000 of that was advanced for the O'Brien Fire, and uh, $1,740,000 was advanced for the Flat Fire, and that um, flat fire advance is essentially a loan until uh, CFPA is reimbursed by the Forest Service. They should be getting that amount completely reimbursed. And then once that money is returned, it will be uh, moved towards the uh, funds 10 million obligation towards this fire season. And all of those transfers will be reflected on my next report as well. Uh, the estimated Ending fund balance on June 30th, 2024 is $10,719,304. And that is the end of my report, unless there are questions. Does that fund, do those, ad, those advances and eventual repayments are not captured in here or how are they captured for well they will CFPA. be on my next report since this report was just my starting balance as of july 1 so they will be shown um as an expenditure okay and it will go it will be counted towards our the 10 million cap okay and what was the total amount of the advance for um coos yeah. it was so we anticipate uh the, that's reimbursable Reimbursable is uh, $1,740,000 will be reimbursed. And then $409,000 was for the O'Brien fire. Okay. Okay, and to make sure I'm understanding that 1.7 is not, both as a debit and eventual credit back, is not shown in the... 20 um the 24 budget here that you just described it's not at the moment but it will on my next report once the transfer is shown All right and it will be and it will be you know part of that 10 million any questions or comments from committee members Nancy, we have Chris up on our screen here, so I can't necessarily see. So feel free to chime in at any time if you have any additional comments to any of the agenda items. Okay, thanks. And I think Lorna spelled out clearly, Nancy Hirsch, the Emergency Fire Cost Committee Administrator, uh, as she was talking about the advance or loan uh, more specifically, and then the advance on O'Brien, um, though not showing on this report, uh, it's a transaction that has been made, but we try to report based on actuals uh, from ODF's accounting reports. And so that's why she's saying it will show up on the next report. Yep, understood. Uh, thank you for that clarification. 
Okay. Thank you, Lorna. Um, with that, we will close that agenda item and move to agenda item number four. Uh, before we do that, I do have one quick go back for those of us, those of you who are participating virtually. Um, we will break this meeting just prior to 11 a.m. Uh, to participate in the statewide fire briefing. Um, so we will put this meeting on ice and that statewide fire briefing will give to the committee. Um, we've done this in years past during fire season. Uh, that typically lasts anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes, depending on content. Um, so, so stay tuned. Uh, we will resume the EFCC meeting once the statewide fire briefing is done. So, uh, agenda item number four, the insurance, uh, listed here as an information or possible decision item. Um, first, uh, I'll hand it over to Mr. Abraham, um, do you want to touch on this topic? I can. Thanks, Brennan. Kyle Abraham, Deputy State Forester, filling in for Cal Mukamoto, who is uh, out today. And I'm going to look to James and Mike. We talked about this briefly last week in terms of um, recommendations and what it may look like for the coming year. And it probably will be a short discussion. James or Mike, who would? All right. Good morning. Mike Shaw, Chief of Fire Protection for ODF. Um, <clears throat> each year, the committee looks to the state forester and provides a recommendation uh, per statute on whether to pursue catastrophic wildfire insurance. I think folks are well aware of uh, the background that this is the first year we have not purchased the insurance for several decades. I think it happened two times over the 51 year uh, duration of the policy, uh, but back in the 70s and 80s was the last time. Um, the intent of the agency, I would say early on was that we would, we would go back and look at whether there was a possibility of catastrophic insurance again for next year at the conclusion of this year. We had an interim conversation with uh, our DAS risk folks, um, Mr. Todd Scharf, and through some conversations with um, Willis Towers Watson, uh, it appears that the uh, there would not be an insurance possibility this year is what uh, all directions uh, point to. And that... Um, what we suspected in February, if we did not move forward with the purchase of the catastrophic policy, uh, that would not be re-offered again. Uh, it sounds like the lead broker um, did, not, uh, did not favor an interest in pursuing, and there were not others that were interested in picking up that torch and moving forward. And so uh, the juice probably isn't worth the squeeze to continue to look for options that all the experts are saying are not available. Very good. Thanks. Anything else to, to add? I mean, I would also, it's my understanding that uh, your biennial budget also did not include James, you want to add anything to that? So, James short, uh, Agency Chief, CFO for, um, yes, you are correct, Brendan. The the one point eight million dollars was removed from our twenty three twenty five biennial budget, so there is no general fund support now for the purchasing of insurance. So uh, we have that component to think about also. So uh, reviewing the statute on this, it it does say the committee will consult with ODF and the option. Um, it's, uh, I opened this up to committee members for uh, conversation or discussion. I, I will lead with, it, it's my opinion that uh, this can stand in as the consultation, recognizing that there likely is not a policy out there for us, uh, for the state to purchase. And currently there's not a budget available to make the purchase of that. Um, so I, I don't feel 
personally, I, I don't feel it's necessary that we provide a recommendation when there, frankly, are no options. Um, with that, I'd open it up to committee members to further discuss if we need to. Uh, I I agree with uh, what you're what you're stating. I, I think this is the outcome of what we knew was uh, likely the the scenario, and um, you know came came to fruition. So I appreciate the information. Any additional likewise, comments? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, likewise, I appreciate the information, but it seems to be a moot point to discuss it any further at this at right now. So. Okay, very good. Uh, I'll also finally say in light of this fire season, um, I have, we're nowhere near uh, what would be the retention level. So uh, though no one could be that clairvoyant, uh, it was a good financial decision today. <laughs> yeah, today. So, okay. Uh, Moving on from agenda item number four, we'll close that one and move to agenda item number five, uh, previous financial claims update. This is an informational item and I look to Ms. Hobbs to give us an update, please. Thanks, Lorna Hobbs, EFCC Finance Coordinator. Um, this report was in your packet. Sorry for the small print on the screen, but um, this is an overview of all of the uh, open fiscal year claims at the present time. Starting with fiscal year 16, which is not on your um, chart there, it's ready to be reconciled with uh, the department. So we are looking to hopefully get that taken care of, meet with ODF in the next few months and um, get that reconciled. Moving on to fiscal year 17, the net claim total is estimated at $9,590,557. And there is one claim remaining open in that Southwest Oregon. And it should be ready to close now that we have received all of the money from FEMA for their Gold Canyon fire. Fiscal year 18, the net claim total is estimated at $35,152,986. There are seven claims open. Three of those are ready to close and three have already been closed out. Fiscal year 19, Net claim total is estimated at $41,708,555. There are six claims open, two of those are ready to close, and two claims have already been closed. Fiscal year 20, the net claim total is estimated at $10,487,368. All claims, uh, there are four claims within that year, and they are all open at the moment. Fiscal year 21, the net claim total is estimated at $44,712,388, and all 10 claims are still open. Fiscal year 22, net claim total for that year is $58,898,582. All eight of the claims are still open. Um, this is the year we are working on uh, filing an insurance claim and we have been working with the uh, insurance claim uh, finance folks and we're hoping to get that wrapped up by the end of the year. For fiscal year 23, the net claim total is estimated at 18 million six hundred and Sorry, I have a typo, $18,655,687. And there are 10 claims, which are all uh, still opened at this time. And there were several late spring fires uh, for fiscal year 23 that actually had some additional districts with claims after, since I reported in my last report, so. 
that is the end of my report, unless you have further questions. Any questions from committee members? Lorna, typically, what's the time period on closing some of these claims? Um, usually the, the cause is waiting for FEMA admin claims to be done and you know they're getting filed a lot faster now you know we sort of had a, a backlog there for a while and so things are really um moving along now so i think you know we're i think we can even get to 17 fy 17 fairly soon too so very good i think we're we're moving good yeah but has moved faster yeah. Yeah. i appreciate that that's both been uh recoveries also sometimes can take a while depending on on how large they are and what's going on with them. So those are yeah. some of the other um, holdups. Doing what we can do, I commend ODF for finding a way to make that work and then developing the relationships with FEMA uh, to really make those things move as fast as they pop possibly can at least. Um, and then the recoveries, I, I assume the total recoveries, those are um, responsible parties recoveries as a part of some of that yes yeah, so the res there's a responsible party co uh, column that gives you the totals for those yeah yep okay do those is that still considered an open claim if doj has not uh, if we haven't settled or are we waiting for the settlement for the do to consider that closed we wait for we wait to close the claim until all recoveries are in ah. even so until all recoveries are in so if they're in a payment plan because some some are then that would leave some, a claim open until yes. ah. until it's fully paid off or or it's settled you know written off so okay in some way all right Understood. And that helps uh, give me some background on what when some claims would remain open because some of those payment replans are, um, they take time. Right, exactly. Okay, understood. Uh, any further comments? Anyone in the room, we can leave this open. All right. Very good. Thank you, Lorna. Uh, Let's move to agenda item number six uh, and receive a very quick uh, weather update. I will look for Blake Ellis or Teresa Alcock to provide it, and I know they are both virtual. Good morning, everyone. My name is Teresa Alcock. I'm the fire planner analyst with the Protection Division. and. Um, presenting some information on uh, fire weather and potential. Just an excerpt today of the big fire briefing that we'll get at 11 a.m. Um, so I'm doing this on behalf of uh, Blake Ellis's request. So thank you. Try to share my screen here real quick. And hopefully everyone can see. So it's just gonna be really quickly. It's just an excerpt of today's full briefing. We'll take a quick look at the National Wildland Fire Potential Outlook, and this is issued monthly. And as of September 1st, we have a new outlook for September and October and through the rest of the year. And then we'll take a quick glance at the six to 10 day temperatures and precepts coming up. And the reason I've chosen this detail is the monthly isn't very uh, strong signal for temperatures. So precepts pretty good, but uh, six to 10 day, at least it'll give us a little bit uh, better idea of what's to come in the next couple of weeks. We did want to take a look at the east winds. East winds are a normal phenomenon in, in, in the fall months of uh, Oregon and Washington state. So we'll take a quick look at what's expected for the next uh, week or so on the east winds, and then round it out with a summary of what we're going to expect for the week. So the National Significant Wildland Fire Potential Outlook was issued again on September 1st, and this is substantially reduced 
from the last issuance in August 1st, um, in that the eastern part of our state is now out of above normal potential for significant wildland fire. But we still have Western Oregon, North Central Oregon, and a lot of uh, Washington state still at above normal potential. And um, most of this is due to, um, even though we've had uh, precipitation, our fuels are still in drought status. And this also in September accounts for the potential of east winds in this national product. Um, into October, on the right side of the screen, uh, we still have this potential above normal potential for Western Oregon and Western Washington, and a little bit down there in Northern California. And uh, things start to taper off uh, by the end of October, and then we go into November and December with a normal wildland fire significant potential. And because the monthly for September, the temperatures are no strong signal there, I thought it'd be helpful to take a look at the six to 10 day, just to get us through the first part of the month here. So uh, a reprieve, uh, we're at near normal temperatures, slightly cooler as you noticed in the last week or so. And, uh, but, the, but it's gonna be drying out a little bit. So um, we had some above normal uh, precipitation in the last week but now we're gonna be drying back up again. So just looking out pretty much the first half of the month here, dry, but cooler. We do have um, a potential for dry east winds. And you guys remember that this is a phenomenon that um, uh, took us uh, in September 20 with the Labor Day fires. Um, we're keeping a, an eagle eye on the east wind potential at every briefing. And uh, so we don't have much going on the first couple of days here, but we do have an incoming cold front, cold, dry front. It's going to be pretty mild, but uh, right when that front comes through, right after, we'll see winds shift and we will have an east wind event uh, September 8th, which is pretty much Friday and in through the weekend. Um, percentages aren't very high. Um, still, like with the Southern Cascades, we've got about 50, 52% chance of having these dry east winds um, and some other places in the northern Cascades. So it's it's not expected to be uh, a massive event here where it's kind of a normal normal event, uh, around 50% likelihood that we will have these dry east winds. So we're going to be looking at this uh, daily as we go through the next weeks or so. So just in summary, we do have the above normal significant fire potential for September in Western Oregon, partly due to east wind potential and these drought influence fuels despite the precip that we've had. Um, it's gonna be mainly dry this week. Uh, we've got an onshore flow remaining relatively cool and mild. So thank goodness. Uh, it will be potentially breezy with some gusts in the afternoons, uh, especially as we get after this cold front moves through and then we'll be watching for those east winds late in the week. And uh, we will be warming up just slightly as we approach into next weekend. So right now we're in about the 70s and 80s around the state. It'll bump up about high 70s, low 80s uh, into the weekend. So we've got a nice uh, kind of a mild week this week to continue to recover from the activity we had in recent weeks. So end of report, unless there's any questions, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alcock. Any questions from the committee members? No, no questions. Thank you. That was uh, that was perfect high level where we were looking for. Uh, that's a good report. I'll take that for September. <laughs> Best time of year in Oregon is the fall, and that sounds like a nice fall forecast. Um, Moving on to agenda item number seven, uh, we'll look for an update on the status of large fire cost collection efforts. Uh, Mr. Miller is deployed with team one. And so Tim Holschback will be standing in for him. Tim, the floor is yours. Good morning. For the record, my name is Tim Holschback. I serve as the deputy chief of policy and planning with the protection division here at ODF. So for the, uh, I'm gonna, have some highlights on the front page. What I've noticed when I uh, looked at it this for this report is the font is getting bigger, even though it's still one page. So uh, that's always good. There's less on the front. Um, 
and I'll highlight a few items that tie into some of what, uh, what uh, Lorna talked through with the fiscal claims. So since the last meeting in June, I'll start with that uh, close, the closed fire cost collection claims. There's uh, three of them on the list, uh, Salts Jetty, uh, Griffin Creek, and Dry Gulch. Uh, Dry Gulch was settled uh, at insurance limits with the help of the uh, DOJ on that one. Um, and that's also was a FEMA fire or FEMA claim as well. So that'll have some of the funds rec uh, primarily going back to FEMA in that one. And that analysis is being done of the distribution. Along with that as well, uh, Griffin Creek was uh, closed. The responsible party has since been de is deceased for that one. Um, and then also the uh, South Jetty fire was a was on Bonneville um, BPA lands and the uh, window of opportunity for or for uh, to seek uh, restitution for that is uh, has been since long expired. So there's a 90 day window after those that uh, we've researched with the uh, fires on those particular lands. And uh, so since uh, these uh, have popped up, the uh, we've been keeping a close eye on the next events though we make sure we hit that window. So that was uncollectible. So that was re uh, removed. No new fire collection claims over $5,000 to report on this one. Um, off the front page, the Hugo Road Fire has since been uh, um, settled with the responsible party. That was a joint settlement between with ODF and the fire marshal's office. We had about one point, just under 1.2 million in total costs for that. And we settled that for uh, $900,000. So that check is in route and should be on the next report as well. So um, DOJs and ODF are continuing to work through uh, settlement negotiations and, and mediation for Neal Rock, Fielder Creek, Archie, Star Mountain, North Bank, Pike Road, and the Kimberling Mountain Fire. A lot of those are part of the uh, 2020 Labor Day fire event. So we're moving toward um, those investigations are getting wrapped up. Fairly complex mix of, uh, of uh, uh, investigating there. So um, additional ones under DOJ review since the last report as well is uh, Ruben Lane, Ruben Lay, Price Boro, and Moon Mountain. Those are new uh, midsummer uh, fires that are uh, human caused. So along that with, uh, um, as Lorna mentioned, going through this pr process, we've identified a few items to help expedite the uh, recovery process. Uh, one is the payment plan template. We've worked with Department of Justice to um, add more um, structure to that template as, as well so that when uh, folks, uh, when those payment plan agreements are are uh, not followed, that we can utilize the Department of Revenue to assist the department. So that took a few additions there, though that change went into play around, place around 2020, 2021 with some of those. So you'll see a few of the older fires, we're reviewing those on um, you know, making sure the juice is worth the squeeze on some of those before they come off the list, but future payment plans will have a little more rigidity to them as well. And also work reviewing the case loads through the cost with uh, Neil Miller and his uh, his work of uh, focusing on reviewing status updates and where we have, um, you know, of either writing off costs where they're uncollectible and identifying those and having the justification of the pay and the, the um, note taking to a uh, to support that those actions as well as where we can have some compromise and and uh, make sure we still have the time value of money incorporated. So with that, uh, pending any questions, end of report. Can you go back to the uh, South Jetty fire concerning Bonneville? Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it's slightly dismayed to hear that statute of limitations expired or whatever the. Yeah. official term is to not be able to collect uh and have the state more or less front the bill for that suppression mm -hmm. um educate me a bit on just the investigation portion of a fire and mike i may look to you wh whomever you need here the timeline of determining cause uh after a start and if there is a 90 day window here, just understanding how quickly we can move forward to that, to be certain that we might be able to start that process within that 90 day window. It's an ODS responsibility, yep. more or less. It's a, I'll call it expediting and prioritizing. So with that, um, with any claim against the federal government, the, uh, uh, especially when it comes from a state, the federal government needs to give permission for a state to make a claim. 
And in this case, they've set that bar on federal lands without an agreement for protection that where the state is forced to respond due to protecting state assets, in essence, private land. Um, they set that window at 90 days to make that claim. And actually through this one, those claims go through FEMA, not the agency, not the landowner or the uh, um, the land administrator. So for this one of vulnerable power, the claim would be put in through FEMA, similar to our other FEMA claims. And then FEMA would review it because um, as uh, uh, on its validity. So it hasn't been, um, haven't gone through that process, but that's the, the time window. As far as the investigation portion of it, I don't believe we, there is a, res, a need for a responsible party. It's just similar to Oregon Forest Land Protection Fund um, funds for threat fires. It's similar um, scope of that. If it's a threat to state protection, then then there's a claim the state can make against the federal government. And under those, there's not that same 90-day window, correct? So for the, for 90 days to put the claim in. Okay. So it's just identifying it, grab, grabbing the cost and submitting it to FEMA. Because even, even this year in Southwest Oregon, we've recognized several Forest Service initiated fires that were a threat to state assets, right, that are under protection. Yep. yep. Well, with the Forest Service, we, we're part of the Master Cooperative Fire Agreement with them, where at Bonneville Power, we're not. So that's the nexus is we don't have an agreement for protection there. Thank you for that. So, yeah, that was, I'd forgotten about that. So. Okay. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's good always to see some closed claims. Uh, thank you for continuing to work on that. Uh, any questions, comments from committee members? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, agenda item number eight is uh, focused on the ARB planning for deductibles. Um, I will ask that uh, Nancy open discussion for this. Um, as a quick reminder, this was a request by the committee, I believe at the last meeting or prior, um, to just help educate us on how this process works and get some background um, for myself and others in the committee. So Nancy, the floor is yours. Sure, thanks. Uh, Nancy Hirsch, the Emergency Fire Cost Committee Administrator. Uh, you have a couple handouts in your meeting material. Um, it's noted at the, I think the agenda item number eight is noted at the bottom of the page. So I'll touch base on the first one. Uh, the title of that should read uh, Policy Context Emergency Fire Cost Committee Deductibles. And I just want to touch briefly on uh, what, what's included here. Uh, the first paragraph is actually a statute, and um, it's a statute relating to your authority that the committee may require the prior to payment of monies from the fund the district uh, expends an amount not to exceed a per acre determined to be 10% of the total statewide budgeted amount. So at the kind of the highest policy level here, this gives you the authority uh, to institute, implement deductibles, which the committee has a long history uh, that's standing. And uh, the current rates on that or at 10 cents an acre for timber and five cents an acre for grazing. Um, moving on to your second paragraph there, it's we move into Oregon administrative rules. Uh, the committee has authority um, to establish administrative rules. These are longstanding. And this next rule uh, basically spells out the timing for when the committee talks about deductibles and uh, typically that's in January of every year. Moving down that page, uh, you'll see the next rule speaks to uh, what's in bold or should be in bold, uh, an additional amount, uh, not considered emergency fire suppression costs. And this is known as the daily deductible. Uh, there are, are three different caveats to how it applies. I'm not going to get into that detail. 
uh, but rather than there is also a ceiling amount that is spelled out on the second page of your handout. And there uh, you will see that you know, that ceiling is set by a 15 cent uh, per acre on timber and a six cent per acre on grazing. And so all that detail uh, ultimately results in a summary, which is your second handout, which is titled FY for fiscal year 24, uh, district deductibles. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll walk you through that table just briefly. On the far left, you have either district or active uh, operating associations listed. And then those second and third columns uh, basically identify that, you know, there's different uh, rates for the different acres associated with either timber or grazing on the fire protection. The fourth column where it says maximum district per day fire deductible, that's really your, what we uh, in simple terms refer to as the, as the daily deductible. Um, the fifth column then is calculating the, the district acreage deductible. And so districts have to pay these deductibles before being eligible for reimbursement. The sixth column subtotals both the deductibles for timber and grazing. And then you have the last column, which is the total amount a district, I say, may have to pay across both deductibles. And obviously it's a may because, you know, there are often a few districts that may not have, you know, more than one or two fires uh, that have a daily deductible. So they would never, you know, reach their ceiling amount. I, I don't have the number uh, specifically in front of me. I think between Tracy Rolson, if he's in the, in the, on the call today, uh, I think the department has been running these on these deductibles on average uh, per year about 1.4 to 1.6 with numbers as high as over 2 million uh, over the last decade. So if you guys have any questions on that, I would take them. If you don't, uh, then we will move to James Short. Uh, the department's chief financial officer to provide a broad uh, overview of the timeline on the department's agency request budget. Not hearing, seeing. No, no questions. You're free to <laughs> continue. All right. So. Uh, thanks, Nancy. Uh, James Short again for the record. So uh, the agency's ARB process actually starts uh, next month at our September 11th full executive team meeting where we start working through our strategic initiative planning for uh, any policy packages, biennial budget changes, um, um, what are our goals and, and any performance or in our long-term visioning. So that's the, the kickoff for that. The um, Deputy State Forester uh, Kyle Abraham has sent out some messages to to the exec team to start planning for what we're looking for for changes for the next 25-27 biennial budget process. And then we're going to uh, work on this and as an executive team trying a new approach and re-looking at our how we work together as a team in our process to identify what are the key um, uh, policy option packages and budget changes for the next coming biennium. Another piece of that is the uh, DAS chief financial office is also looking um, through the process for their side to instruct agencies through their instructions also and looking to possibly, possibly revamp that process too for agency request budgets. It's been a while since the our instructions have from DAS have changed and with the, the new governor, Governor Kotek, they're taking a fresh look at the budgeting process for the agencies. So more to come on that, um, that we should start seeing information in late fall 
early winter. The first uh, step in in the process, the historical process, is coming before the Board of Forestry and at the January meeting to establish our guiding principles for budgeting. And then that gives us our, what the board wants to, the principles behind our budgeting process and what we're looking at for as an agency. And then um, the next board meeting would uh, bring our policy option package concepts to the board that the, the division operating programs have worked on and vetted through the executive team and we move there. And then for the final, I believe it's in the, June meeting. Don't quote me on the the timing of the Board of Forestry meeting, but when they will have our final pops policy option packages, and they approve the board will approve our policy option packages for the agency for a August submission to the governor's office in twenty twenty four for that piece of it. Um, there is the agency has um, is looking at some if like ways to to maximize general fund for the uh, for the fire program and other operating programs to for costs that we don't realize for inflation above inflationary factors that um, that we haven't realized before in the past so we're going to do some technical adjustments to help achieve that for for colas to returning seasonals on the firefighting side, just because that piece has outpaced the what is our standard inflation that we receive. So we're looking at some concepts there on the budget side to, to help minimize the impact to the to the rate and to the landowners on that side. So that's that in a nutshell, it's pretty early in the process, uh, but it's really the executive teams starting up a, what our initiatives are going to be for in working with the Board of Forestry. Kyle, do you have anything to add or on? No. Captain Walker. Okay. Thoroughly complex. It is. It's thoroughly complex and it's thoroughly uh, frustrating process because you go through the whole process and then you get your governor's budget and all the extra work that the budget, the biennial budget staff puts into it, the hours and all the redundant keying into systems to back it all out when the governor is not in the governor's budget. So you know, I think DAS realizes that and is trying to make some improvements to the budgeting process for us. So look forward to this. Yeah, again, it, the reason that we asked for this brief and this introduction, and I appreciate what you and Nancy have provided, is that, I mean, this committee does have a nexus to that process. Um, and it's one that I want to make sure that we take seriously. Uh, and part of that is understanding uh, the background and the timeline um, that make, because I believe questions have been asked and it's generally the answers are, well, now is not the right time, right? And so uh, this committee's starting that background right now, uh, not looking to make any moves, any changes, only just an informational. So I, I appreciate that information. Uh, any questions Actually, from- Do you have a follow-up to that piece of it for you? By all means. So if as the committee makes a decision on their deductible in the rate, the Oregon Forest Land Protection Fund uh, biennial budget limitation is embedded in the fire program. So if there is an increase in the deductible piece of it, then we'll, the agency will need to do a, a, a package or adjustment to the other fund limitation that we receive to correspond that piece. So as the agents or as the committee is making a determination of what we will need to work hand in hand on that piece of it through Nancy and, and so that the budget shop is aware of that so we can do an adjustment to the fire programs other fund limitation spending authority so ultimately understanding the timelines uh, uh and this is we would need that january meeting would be the time where we would need to be having more in-depth conversations about that is that correct that is correct okay. yes because we will start our process for those adjustments in late winter early spring okay Okay. And ultimately, if we needed to, we could hold a special meeting to just adjust, to address that topic. Um, but okay. 
Uh, any questions from the committee members or comments? Uh, any final comments, Nancy, on this topic? Sounds good, Brennan. Uh, you characterized it correctly, and uh, we'll chat for January. And as uh, it's a standing agenda item in January, um, it would be uh, if there was, you know, an elaborate discussion. Uh, certainly, as you've already mentioned, you could have a special meeting, and certainly, I would be working with James um, as needed. Thank you. Uh, I think now is a, a good time for us to start our break uh, ahead of the statewide fire briefing. Uh, I was informed that we have to log out of this meeting and just a moment. So we can keep, can we keep this meeting room open? Okay, we'll keep this meeting room open. Uh, you probably won't hear anything if you're visit if you're with us virtually and uh, we'll log in for those in the room here to get the statewide fire briefing. Um, and we'll give fair warning to those of you who are virtually that we will start back up. Uh, I would anticipate check back in here at about 1130 and we can give an idea of when we'll be started resuming the EFCC meeting. Okay, I think we are ready to resume the EFCC meeting today. <clears throat> um, thank you for those who had to take a quick break uh, to coming back with us. And we, for those of you who may have missed before, we are on agenda item number nine, administrative branch report. Uh, I will look to, I'll, I'll hand it over to any of you and you can Rochambeau for who goes first. I can I can start if you'd like. Thanks, Brennan. For the record, Kyle Abraham. Again, just a, a few things to cover. As you mentioned briefly, the fire funding. Uh, you know, obviously sworn to secrecy, but uh, Cal is anticipating a meeting coming up for that group, and we've been doing a bit of work internally uh, to um, gather information on how other states sort of fund their fire protection systems. Um, a lot of those don't overlap with how Oregon system works, and we know that. Uh, and we'll have some discussion, um, or Cal will have that discussion with the committee about options that work for um, Oregon coming up. So looking forward to that. We also have uh, the beginning parts of the hazard map update, and maybe Mike will cover that in more detail, but those uh, uh, community meetings will be happening starting this week, uh, September 8th. So all of you remember the hazard map um, direction that we got out of Senate Bill 80 to engage with communities, county commissioners across the state. So that'll be happening over the next month. Um, we also are anticipating a full room here, the Board of Forestry meeting September 6th and 7th. So uh, up to two hours of public comment both days on on the agenda, as well as some pretty significant topics for the board to consider. Um, you know, this is their last regularly scheduled business meeting of the year, and we'll have some other board of forestry meetings related to um, strategic planning and uh, other things throughout the year. But this is this is a big one coming up. So this I anticipate this room will be completely full, and the parking lot will be full, and probably other spaces on campus will be full um, next two days. I also want to mention that we did uh, hire a new HR director a couple months ago, Wendy Heckman. So we're grateful to have her services here at ODF, um, leading our HR department and, you know, sort of establishing a role and engagement for HR with the executive team. So that's a big win for us as an agency. And then also... Uh, there is a new director at the Oregon Department of Emergency Management. We've mentioned the FEMA claims and the relationship that we've had there. So Cal and myself are looking forward to engaging with that new director 
here in the next few months to talk about our agency uh, connection and particularly with FEMA claims and status. So their first day is today. Her name is Erin McMahon. Uh, she's new to the state and we're looking forward to establishing that relationship and, um, you know, talking more about how ODF and Oregon part of, of emergency management can engage in the future. That's all I got. Thank you. Any questions? Chris? Okay. Thank you, please. Thanks, Kyle. For that. All right. So for the agency financial report, as of today, our main cash account for the agency is at $36.6 million. Um, in addition, the Oregon Forest Land Protection Fund balances $10.6 million as of today. And that includes the draws or disbursements to the Coos FPA too. So just give you a little highlight there. Um, uh, right now, the agency has $16.9 million of uh, pending payments, 10 million of that is uh, to the U.S. Forest Service slash BLM for prior season fires that has, that's been on the books for a while. But other uh, outside of that, it's $6 million in payables out, which is an average turnaround time of 15 days on invoices right now. So pretty, it's gone down from this time last year. We were looking at 45 days. So we're 30 days quicker now and we're fully staffed and except for one person out on team one right now. So, but we're getting stuff paid out and, uh, and feeling really good of where the agency's sitting on there with their expenditure payments. So to everybody, um, next piece would, I'll just go right into the FEMA. So then Tracy can f finish up on the other items. So since our last EFCC meeting, the, uh, agency has received $6.4 million from FEMA FMA claims, uh, and $1.5 million in, FEMA public assistance grants or claims. So we still have an outstanding balance of $26.9 million. And that's it. And we have $2.8 million of items yet to invoice. And majority of that is from the 2018 to 2000 to 2021 admin claims. So we have four years of admin claims and plus the admin claim for the 2020 fire season too. So we're moving right along. Um, of the outstanding claims, $23.1 million has been obligated to OEM for the public assistance from the 2020 fire season. We're working with the new OEM director and try to speed up the process. Uh, we've been uh, told that we should have majority of that money to ODF by end of September. We're cautiously optimistic, but we'll we'll continue to work with our sister state agency on that piece of it. So um, then on for the FMEG side of it, we have about $1.1 million that we have yet to uh, invoice out on that. So we're the the FEMA, the protection financing and the FEMA group has done an amazing job of get, getting stuff turned around in a timely manner. For one fire, I believe on the FMAG side, it took from data submission to payment it was less than six months for a suppression claim. That's pretty amazing. So if there isn't any questions, that's in the report. Yeah. No. Any questions? All right. All right, I'll carry on over with the uh, severity and the strategic investments update. Uh, Tracer Olson, Protection Finance Unit Manager for ODF. Uh, good morning, Chair and Board Members. Chris, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Um, sorry uh, that the severity sheet is a little bit small on screen here. I know you all have a copy of that, but uh, as we build these dashboards um, to provide all the pertinent information for management decisions to be made, sometimes they get a little bit big. Uh, we're all used to that. So, but just some highlights here. This is a fluid document. Um, this was a, a report out from middle of last week. Um, and obviously numbers have changed since then, but more importantly here, I just want to follow up on what James was saying with the FEMA um, dollar reimbursements. Um, and in upper right corner are two uh, FEMA pre-positioning claims for aircraft um, on incidents uh, that we're um, going to be submitting claims for here shortly, um, totaling approximately around $600,000 at this point of money coming back from FEMA in that aspect. 
the prepositioning claims, they roll a little bit faster. Usually uh, we get that money back um, faster on those claims than a full boat uh, incident with many, many resources on them. Um, so look forward to getting that in the door here fairly shortly. Um, overall, though, um, you know, we have a $10 million uh, allocation between OFLPF and general fund. Um, and right now we're spent a little over half of that uh, with about $4 million remaining in allocation through the end of fire season. We're still awaiting some final billings to come through. Uh, so again, like I said, this is a fluid document um, with, up, with new numbers being input at all times. Um, projected balance though, um, as we continue to fly off aircraft and assign them the incident, uh, we're hoping to narrow that gap on the projected ending balance um, to get that closer to zero dollars based on what our projected budget was um, for this uh, fire season. Um, if you don't mind scrolling down to the next page, more importantly for the Oregon Land Forest Protection Fund, um, dealing with the um, dollar amount, and not sure if you can scroll down to the next page. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. There we go. Um, and it, I'm not sure if you can make it a little bit bigger or not, but again, the box that's in gray, um, out of the um, $5 million um, that is 60% um, OFLPF and then covered by 40% general fund, um, that has been expended um, through this uh, fire season already, where OFLPF has met its $3 million and the match of general fund of $2 million. So the remainder from here on out is covered by general fund 100%. I'll pause there for any questions. No, no questions. I just want to make sure that that information provided is captured and posted to the EFCC website afterwards. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Um, and if we could scroll back up or over, sorry, uh, your tab strategic investments. Uh, let's roll over to that real quickly and give a brief update on that. The top tab there to the left of the one that you have highlighted. Yep, the 09. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so a uh, quick synopsis on the strategic investments um, that uh, the $14,000 that was carried over. Uh, from the 2017 investments that was carried over to 2020. Um, the only outstanding project still being worked on there um, is the aerial IR technology um, dealing with the part Navia. Um, and outstanding balance are about $14,000, but that has already been allocated. Um, and technically the project is balanced to zero there. That's why we see undistributed funds of $0. So hoping to get that wrapped up soon and we can totally close out 2017. Um, and synopsis for 2020, um, currently uh, actual dollar spent is $418,653. Uh, you'll see pending expenditures of a negative 3,653. Um, that was a um, over, over expenditure um, on the CFPA uh, microwave tower, which we have uh, billed them back to balance that books out to uh, zero dollars on that end. Um, as far as all the other projects going, uh, there are a few projects that are completed already. The Southwest Detection Center has been completed. Um, I mentioned the microwave tower for CFPA and the COD grapple dozer is also completed. All others are in progress um, or not started at this time frame yet. Um, of note, the EOA detection cameras, they're finishing up their SB762 funded detection cameras and then moving on to this project next. Um, and Northeast Oregon has their bridge peak camera live um, as of August 24th um, with those funds being used from the strategic investments. I'll pause there. Uh, any questions dealing with the current balance? Uh, remaining project balance is $1,047,000 um, to expend um, on the district side and get these projects on the ground. I appreciate the high level update on the strategic investment funds. Um, I would ask that for our upcoming January meeting, if we can see any 
specifics, just r- recognizing um, in a little bit more detail the good things that are being done and uh, of those funds and and any ROIs we were able to capture this year, right? You bet. And if you just want to scroll down here real quickly, um, on the subsequent sheets on this document um, is going to be the 2017. Uh, I was chatted about just the part now via left. And scroll down one more um, page down to the bottom. Um, we keep the running documents in the in the field updates this on currently what the status of, of their projects. Um, so this might provide a little bit of that detail, but yes, be more than happy to go through that more in depth at the next meeting. That'd be good. That'd be a good primer uh, that wasn't and sent out in the meeting notes, at least as I have them. Um, but uh, nevertheless, seeing the positives and challenges of how those are being deployed uh, will will be helpful for this committee. Copy. Thank you. End of report. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, anything else on that agenda item? Okay. Very good. Any questions from committee members? Additional comments, Chris? Eric? Okay, moving right along. Uh, agenda item number 10, the protection division report. Uh, Mr. Shaw, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, for the record, Mike Shaw, Chief of Fire Protection. Uh, thank you, Chair Geraltz. Uh You heard the fire season update. So um, I'm not going to go into a whole lot more detail, but I did have a couple things I wanted to maybe linger on. Uh, want to linger on the statistics a little bit. Uh, 97% of our 10 year average number of fires is kind of where we're sitting at. So it's a really average year for number of fire starts. That's very consistent for ODF. What's really good and that we, we highlighted this morning and I will continue to highlight is that the acres burned is significantly lower than our 10 year average. We're sitting at about 16.6% of our 10 year average acres burned. So this year, just a little over 13,000 acres, our 10 year average is north of 78,000 acres. Obviously some very large fire seasons contribute to that number, uh, but it is very telling to the success at IA. Uh, and that success is really multifaceted. Uh, it's early detection, it's aggressive IA, it's aggressive aircraft and it's cooperators. Uh, we could not do this without cooperators. And so I'll speak to that just a little bit and then I'll close on fire season because you've heard enough about it. Uh, on August 24th and 25th, we had a pretty significant lightning event that came through. Uh, what was unique about that lightning event was that it was predominantly dry, predominantly on the west side of the Cascades. And that is not normal. Uh, from the California border to the Washington border on the west side of the Cascades, as the lightning slopped over onto the east side of the Cascades, there was a little bit more moisture with it. They did get some lightning, but not to the same level as on the west side. Uh, on the west side, on ODF protection, there was almost 500 lightning strikes. Um, cloud to ground strikes on ODF protection in a mostly dry lightning event. We picked up somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 new fire starts. Uh, that's a very efficient fire starting lightning storm. That's one in five. Uh, and for us to be successful, as successful as we were at catching fires um, from the California border to the Washington border would not have been possible without the partnerships that we have uh, and the aggressive attack that that we have been engaged in from, from the get-go this fire season. So uh, just really wanted to highlight that as a real success story. Uh, one cluster of 19 individual fires called the Tai Ridge Complex was was a, a cluster of fires we were unable to get in. Uh, I just talked to the incident commander, Joe Hessel, who's a retired ODF uh, firefighter, arguably one of our most uh, successful over his career. And when I was talking to him yesterday, he said, I continue to go to fires and I think I've seen the steepest ground around and I continue to find equally as or steeper ground than what I thought was the steepest I'd ever seen. And so when somebody like Joe tells me that, I know that that was a very, very difficult location for 19 individual fires on the landscape. And that really contributed to, uh, to the ability of that fire to get, get large and require a, a fire team to manage. So, um, uh, 
All that said, I know uh, at the end brief, I did talk to you, uh, Brennan, and I know that your folks were engaged on several of the fires down there without any ODF folks on some of those fires. And that's really a testament to the complete and coordinated system and how it all works and how we play together um, and how important fire suppression is uh, for this agency and, and the landowners who we provide fire protection for. So really wanted to call that out to the group and say thanks uh, for everybody. And then uh, I think we're gonna, we have just a couple of items and typically you hear from Ron Graham, but I do wanna say, uh, so Ron is out uh, on some personal business. Blake Ellis, our fire operations manager is, is covering for Ron. And I do wanna say uh, Blake is, for those that don't know Blake, he is really the linchpin uh, that pulls together the support for districts. Uh, when fire districts need help, whether that's a fire team, whether that's additional resources, uh, whatever that is, Blake is the go-to guy in the protection division, and he makes it all run. Uh, he has been running pretty hard this year. I, there, there's some reports he's lost a couple of pounds because he's been running so hard. Uh, so just want to maybe call out to you, Blake, uh, sincere appreciation for your efforts this year. And uh, I will turn it over to you for BLM and GeoBoard on behalf of Ron. Yeah, thank you for that introduction, Mike, and about 25 pounds in the last two months, so um, feeling it. Uh, <laughs> um, I I will say, so my name is Blake Ellis, for the record, Blake Ellis, Fire Operations Manager, Oregon Department of Forestry. Um, I'm not the the politician that that Mike and, and Ron may be, so I apologize if if some of my presentations a little bit um, a little bit lax. But just hitting on that that IA piece, our our folks out there have been kicking some serious booty, um, and so um, I hope you guys understand how hard folks are out there working to ensure that your invest investments are are um, are are met um, with with success. So. Um, starting with the BLM update, uh, we sent them the final invoice for fiscal year 23. Um, it was about $160,000 over the initial estimate. Also working on the first invoice for fiscal year 24, which covers August and September fire seasons. Uh, Cal is currently setting up a meeting with the BLM state director and our active association. So CFPA, DFPA and Walker Range. Uh, talking about the, the new operating plan coming up. The current uh, Western Oregon operating plan ends June 30th of 2024. Um, in terms of what to look for, I, I would say it's kind of a status quo approach on our operating plan moving forward. Uh, and the finances should be business as usual. Uh, moving to GeoBoard update. Um, and we skipped the last meeting due to fire activity. Um, we were we were inundated with quite a few um, small and large fires on the landscape. And uh, the members of the geo board are typically uh, district foresters, district managers, and incident commanders across the state. And um, all of our uh, geo board membership was um, well. The district foresters and managers were inundated with fire at the time. And so priority number one. Um, with ODF is initial attack and ensuring that we're we're getting after fires and paying paying as much attention as we can uh, to those fires. And so uh, we made the decision to cancel uh, that meeting. Uh, what I will say is that, that moving forward, uh, we will continue to focus on succession management within our incident management teams um, for the CNG. So that's command and general staff and beyond, right? So that's the that's the main focus. Um, the geo board does not get into day to day business of the protection division, but provides uh, oversight and recommendations for our incident management teams. Um, there's membership from all programs, all divisions, all areas, um, including district foresters and um, district managers. So, um, yeah, really, really good stuff. We've we've seen. Um, uh, amazing support from the geo board, um, which translates to broader uh, understanding and awareness um, across the agency from program to program. Uh, moving to strategic investments, um, I have uh, Teresa Williams, uh, district forester with the Klamath Lake District, and she's a new district forester, and that that title sounds really good on her. Um, she's like she would like to propose a change to the initial proposal for a guard station. Um, and uh, Teresa, are you on? Are you able to, to jump on? Yep, I'm on. All right, so I will kick it over to you. Uh, you have the floor. 
Okay, perfect. Thanks. So I put together a quick little PowerPoint if you guys want that, or do you just want to do it uh, kind of the conversation way? I'll let you guys choose what's going to work best for you. I promise it'll be to the point and not too long. So what's your preference? I'm open to whatever you're most comfortable with and would look to other committees members. I see some head nodding. Yeah. Well, you, you made the effort with the PowerPoint. Why don't you give it? <clears throat> We'll make it conversational nonetheless. Perfect. I like it. Okay. So let me know when you can see my screen. Yep, we have it up now. Okay. Perfect. So what this is, is it's just a revision to the Klamath Lake uh, strategic investment proposal that was put in a couple years ago. And I know we've revised it a couple times. Um, and so thanks for your time for letting us uh, do this. So the currently approved strategic proposal was basically the purchase of an existing estate, um, you know, 300,000 with 55,000 matching funds for the total project of 355,000. The reason we're looking at revising it, uh, here is one piece of property, the only piece of property currently available in the Bly, Oregon area. Not sure how familiar you guys are with rural Lake County and Klamath County, but uh, this is an area that's a population of 207. So if you look at this one piece of property that's available currently, it's a three bedroom, two bath manufactured home uh, with 23 acres. And if you look down below, um, it shows since 2020, it was at 400,000 uh, and now it's currently selling for $700,000. So as you guys know, this is not going to work with $300,000 to invest in something. Uh, the other piece of being a manufactured home, they just don't tend to hold up uh, as well as every as a stick-built home. Um, and then above and beyond that, it's above the uh, BOV, the broker opinion of value that ODF is allowed to purchase. The other issue that we've ran into with real estate in that area is it either doesn't have a foundation or even if we found something within the $300,000 range, uh, tends to not, um, it's going to need probably about $100,000 in a remodel to make it work for us. So just wanted to share this piece here so you guys could see what's currently available because I'm sure you guys aren't on Zillow looking at, at real estate available in Bly, Oregon. Um, we've been looking in that area for probably about three years now. And I think when the original uh, ask went in, Dustin Gustavison had found a piece of property that actually would have worked for us. It was perfect, but it took us about three years to be able to get approval for those funds. And so that has since sold. Uh, so our, our change here in our request is a long-term lease agreement with a local landowner. And this is actually a picture of that piece of property. Um, it's with the Jacob, Jacobs Ranch. And the Jacobs family originally uh, came to the Bly area in 1881. Um, and then bought their first uh, home and have actually grown the ranch uh, in 1938. So it's a family that's been around for quite a while in that Bly area. So some of the, um, sorry, there's some stuff on my screen. I got to move around here for a second. So some of the benefits of this, obviously, is this would be new construction. So we don't have to worry about something that's already uh, needing to be maintained it's got ease of access via Highway 140, and it's centrally located within our district between both the Klamath and the lake units. Uh, full connectivity, which is hard to find in a lot of these areas, so you've got power, phone, cell service, radios, etc. cetera. Uh, continuing our local partnerships is always a huge plus for us. Uh, the biggest selling point for me on this is the 50-50 partnership on maintenance, winterization, and rodent control, because that's a lot of issues that I know we've had with these guard stations out in these remote areas. Uh, and so basically, the landowner would utilize it in the off season for their ranching needs, and we would use, utilize it during fire season. Uh, the lease agreement is fully transferable is how we would write this lease agreement. So if, uh, you know, the family's been around since 1881, like I said, but if for some reason some unforeseen circumstances happened, it would fully transfer to what the who the new owner would be. Uh, another benefit is the immediate start to the project uh, and then increase in recruitment and fire response in the Bly area because we did have to uh, move one of our Bly engines to Lakeview to staff it this year. So we've only had one engine out of Bly, so we could potentially have three if we have the housing available for folks as we're doing recruitment. Um, for some reason, my screen doesn't want to advance. 
There we go. So this is not really a good picture of the plans, but, uh, and I don't blame the landowner, right? So the landowner already paid to have plans drawn up and put together. And he did ask for some of our input in general terms of what it is we would be looking for. Um, and he and his uh, architect came up with this together and it's not something that he has really shared and given us copies, which I don't blame him. This is his own investment of something he's moving forward with. Um, but part of it you can see is there's four bedrooms over there to the right hand side, there's three more to the left, and then it's got the general great room, living room, dining room, and kitchen area. Uh, the back covered entry would actually be enclosed is something that we talked about. Um, and that's mainly for a mud room for folks to keep their fire gear, you know, all the dirty stuff outside um, so that we can continue to keep it all put together well. And it's about 2,800 square feet is how big. Uh, the living facility would be. Something you don't see on these plans is it actually would also have room for a connex for a cache and a shop area, and then room for a helipad. And within that picture, um, you guys could probably see the big meadow out there. We would also have room if we needed to stage more than one helicopter, have a helibase or a type three team in place. Uh, we could also have that there. So that's what I've got for you guys. Um, I know you probably have some questions on what that long-term lease agreement would look like, and I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding that or anything else that you might have. Well, you already brought up my first question. Uh, so uh, what, what are the terms of that lease and any other details you can provide on that? Yeah, so we have flexibility in that, and I've been working with facilities, Salem facilities, on what that could look like. Um, and we have a lot of different options with that. So we were looking at a 10 to 20 year lease. It just kind of depends on what we settled on. Um, I would prefer to go out further than 10 years because 10 years really isn't that far. If you think about a new building and investment, I was thinking more of a 20 year lease. But how the funding would work is we would do um, like a one year a 12 month lease where we would pay them X amount to start with giving that landowner some capital to be able to start the construction of the facility. And then after that six months or one year that increases to another amount. So they'd have more capital to continue with it. And it's not just the strategic investment funds that will build this. Um, they have put in a lot of their own money and are continuing to do that. They could put up, um, the capital to build the building to start with, and then we could just lease it. But we really want a say in what it looks like and and what quality and how it's done. And so that's our way of being able to do that. So I would say probably in, in talking to Chris and facilities, we were thinking a 20 year uh, lease is what we were thinking. Any other questions from <clears throat> committee members? So the, the $350,000 request for total project, uh, how is that proposed to be distributed? Is that going towards the, the capital of the construction of the building? Part of it, yeah. So that's what I was talking about with the lease. And there's lots of different options that we can we can do. You know, we could come back to you and let you know what terms we settle on. But part of that would go, um, you know, with that first 12 month lease of the property. So we're holding that property for us so that he could start the construction. So say we did $100,000 for the first 12 month lease. And then after that 12 month, it would be another, you know, for six months, it could be 100,000 or, or however we decide to do that, but it would use the strategic investment funds in order to do that. Ultimately, what we're looking at is spending $350,000 for a lease of a property, but really the the lease is to help kick off the construction of right. a building that is not um, it, whatever the terms of the lease are. It's an asset that the state can only hold on to for the terms of the lease. <clears throat> Correct. Yes. And yeah. the landowner is willing to go beyond the 20 years if we need to. Um, and that would be in terms of just wise investment, prudent investment of dollars, it, um, setting up at lease terms. What I would feel most comfortable with is setting up lease terms that look far out into the future, uh, but recognizing there needs to be some short term certainty, uh, finding that balance between 
long-term investment of these this capital outlay, but mm -hmm. uh, short-term certainty for both the landowner and ODF, right? Uh, it's good to understand that that lease would be transferable. I think that's definitely a must um, just as our state is changing in ownership and types of owners out there. Um, but I would encourage you to see what, what terms you can kind of start to nail down on that lease. Um, 20 years in my time horizon actually seems kind of short. And I absolutely agree with you that 10 years seems incredibly short. Um, uh, for my position, and this is a committee matter, I'm comfortable with moving forward with this, but I'm perhaps needing to see a little bit more, uh, a better understanding and a little better nailed down uh, terms of the lease. Yeah, but, and that's yeah. for... Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to let you know, we just started the conversation because we didn't even know if this was something that uh, we could utilize the strategic investment funds for. So definitely something that we would work on now, you know, once we get the approval from you guys that you would support this, um, that would be the next step is making sure that we have all of that figured out and the details um, on the lease agreement and how that's going to work. So I guess my question would be ongoing obligation. I assume that's going to the state uh, for uh, ongoing lease payment. I mean, that's. No. So actually this landowner is willing to um, accept the 300,000 and then the 55,000 in kind and the district contribution uh, for the full long-term lease. The only additional oh. obligation we would have would be the 50, 50 and the maintaining of the building in the facility. Uh, it wouldn't be a continued lease. Once that $355,000 had been met, the lease agreement and payment or the agreement stays in place, but the payments stop. Hmm. That's a, that changes things a bit. Yeah. In my understanding. Thank you. That's a pretty good bargain. Yeah. Yeah. With an understanding that the lease term is in the twenties. Right. Of course. Um, well, as a committee, I guess, uh, before us, we have, uh, it seems we have a bit of a chicken and egg issue. Um, you need some certainty of the funds and, you know, we're looking for, uh, some certainty in the term, um, Any proposals on a motion here? <laughs> <laughs> I I will say I'm I'm uncomfortable with ten. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Um. And though I don't like to, we could put some caveats on this motion. Yeah. Still in yeah. concept. I, oh, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. I was just going to say something to the effect of uh, I think we could, or at least I could, um, support the uh, the concept minus the details, other than the important detail being that the uh, lease be for at least a minimum of 20 years. I would agree. I can get behind that. All right. Uh, and then uh, if that we'll get to the formality of that, but that puts some uh, a challenge to you, Teresa. Right. To to push for that. Um, if you're unable to achieve that, I would encourage you to come back mm -hmm. to this committee um, with the best you can come up with. But that does also that does I think uh, and a bargaining chip in your negotiations with the Jacob Rantz family uh, give you a solid ground to stand on and help work with them for that. Um, do you want to make 
Go ahead. Do you feel like you have enough information to carry that conversation forward? Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I haven't even started negotiations or what that would look like other than, you know, talking long-term lease and a hundred year lease even was thrown out there at one point in the general conversations with the landowner. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. Yeah. And I, uh, this is just some food for thought, but a recognition of uh, you can structure leases in many different ways. Right. And this, uh, by that certainty, uh, for 20 years, with options to continue mm -hmm. um, and mutual party negotiations for the next 80. Um, just food for thought in your conversations with them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but in, in terms of the decision space of this committee, uh, Chris, you want to go ahead and make your motion formally? Yeah, I would uh, like to move to uh, support this uh Blygard Station project in principle, uh, with the caveat that uh, any uh, lease that is negotiated have at a minimum uh, 20 year uh, term. And I'd second that. Okay, we have a motion on the table to uh, approve the modification for the Blygard Station uh, with a minimum of a 20 year term lease. Um, provided we can achieve that, uh, you'll have authority to spend those funds. Uh, all those in favor, reply with aye. 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 Okay, none opposed. The motion carries. Good luck. Great. Thank you guys so much for your time today. Thank, thank you. you. I and think it's a great win-win. Yeah, and thank you for your creativity. Uh, when this was initially proposed, housing prices have done different things since then. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, I will say that I am familiar with that Bly country in Lakeview, the greater area. And I, uh, this goes back to a comment Steve Caffaretta made when we looked at this, that uh, having a guard station there, I think, is very important uh, for Eastern Oregon and that area. And I'm optimistic that with it, you'll be able to uh, be able to meet some staffing requirements that is becoming more and more of an issue. Um, and it sounds like it's a good win for ODF and a good win for that landowner as well. That's that's good um, good cooperation, good strategic thinking. Well done. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Uh, okay. Um, anything else in terms of the protection division report? Nothing for me. Okay. Uh, I want to close on your comment and, and say I appreciate your recognition of the success uh, and the fact that uh, as much as the public likes to know that it is ODF, that it's really about ODF and the partnerships and that complete and coordinated system. And, um, you know, the company I work for had opportunities to go out and we would not have been successful had it not been for the background support and cooperation with uh in that area, DFPA, the active association to help make us successful uh, and have the trust for us. Um, the other comment I'll make is I know there is uh, a, and Blake made this, a challenge for the middle management on incidents, right? Those single resource bosses. And I was pleased to hear him make a comment about succession planning for that. And I would say that's across the entire fire system where we really lack that. Uh, the partners can bring a lot to bear to an incident, but without the middle management to help oversee that, keep them safe and make them effective, uh, it's it's always disappointing and, uh, to be sitting at fire camp waiting for additional resources to help um, them. And I, I would encourage uh, ODF to do what they can and keep that in their sights of training up these future firefighters because those really are the ones that get it done on the ground um, and and make everybody successful. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks, Brennan. Um, <clears throat> it actually is really has risen to a focal point for us. Um, started a few years years ago when we started with the geo board when we were concerned we weren't even going to be able to staff our three teams and we got to a good spot 
with our teams, but that's just a small piece. Uh, and so we really need to keep the foot on the gas and we need to take a very aggressive approach to training opportunities and getting folks out so that we can get them qualified into positions so that we can do all that work. And I think Blake and crew have done a good job this year. There's always room to improve. And, and, uh, this is not the first time Blake's heard me say it, but, uh, literally when we're talking on the phone, I'm like, so we have a trainee going, right? Yep. Already got it. And so the, the staff is really entrenched in that, but we really need to keep doing that at all costs. Yeah. Those are your future ICs. Absolutely. No, and, and I appreciate it. I've I've witnessed that on the ground. So it's a it's a recognition of a problem and a recognition of your uh, strategic drive to solve that. So thank you. Uh, with that, we'll close agenda item number ten and move on to number eleven, the EFCC administrator report. Uh, Nancy, are you still with us? Yep. Good afternoon, I guess now. Uh, appreciate that uh, discussion. And um, my mind is uh, telling me and my passion that I would love to come back as a single resource boss, uh, but, my a but my AGE won't allow it. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Nancy Hirsch, the Emergency Fire Cost Committee Administrator, um, just a few items to touch base on. Um, we had uh, previously stated that we would bring to you the fiscal year 22 fire season 21 audit report at this meeting. And uh, because we are focused on the insurance claim year, uh, we had just a few outstanding details. So we will bring that report um, as it's cleaned up uh, to the January meeting along with then the FY23 fire season 22 audit report. Uh, you are and have been receiving um, the estimated large fire costs uh, throughout the summer. Uh, we'll have an update on Friday. Uh, I think you also heard during the briefing, um, it appears that we would be over the 20 million uh, mark for net. And uh, that would basically absorb um, the Emergency Fire Cost Committee's Oregon Forest Land Protection Fund obligation for this season or fiscal year. I had visited with uh, Chair Geralt's earlier uh, this summer. Uh, one of the things in some of the reorganization at Department of Forestry, I recently moved uh, my office um, over into uh, basically the financial uh, groups office area on the Salem ODF um, compound there. And as a result of that, something I had been wanting to do for quite some time was to really deal with uh, a package of, you might want to call them legacy hard copy files that date back from the early days of the Oregon Forest Land Protection Fund and the committee's work. And so I have had somebody um, scanning uh, so that we can get all the meeting minutes uh, uh, protected electronically. And as that becomes available, in a full package, I'll certainly make sure that you have access to those. Uh, now, I've also visited with um, the person in charge of the Forest History Center, and they have uh, decided that some of those files, uh, they too will actually want to maintain some of the hard copies. So I'll be working uh, with him as well. And then lastly, um, I'm uh, going to assume uh, with confidence, uh, but to be determined by the Board of Forestry tomorrow, uh, Catherine Van Etta's um, appointment. But uh, for all of you, I will be assuming um, appointment, uh, following up with her and doing a similar kind of uh, onboarding, kind of basics, background, et cetera. And I look forward to that. So end of report, unless any of you have questions. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much, Nancy. A good report. Um, all right, we'll close out this meeting with uh, item number 12, the public comment. I'll pause for a brief second here to see if we see any hands raised or any comments in the chat. Any comments from the room? No, uh, very good. The next quarterly FCC meeting will be Tuesday, January 2nd, and the Board of Forestry, as typical, meets on Wednesday, the January 3rd. 
Uh, and if all me members, committee members agree, we'll adjourn this meeting. Very good. All right. Uh, today's meeting of the UFCC uh, will close at 1224. Thank you very much for attending.